Hello everybody, welcome back to Selections and Masking in Photoshop. This is the start of chapter number two, where we talk about the different types of masks that you can find in Photoshop. And this is lesson 2.1, where we go over the layer masks. Layer masks are the type of mask that's used the majority of the time in Photoshop. Usually when we refer to a mask, this is the type of mask that we're talking about. These are core to what we call the non-destructive workflow, within Photoshop because it's a way of hiding pixels without deleting them. In that sense, it's non-destructive in that you can alter the appearance of a layer without actually changing the pixels of that layer. And masks do this by defining the transparency of that layer or more accurately, the opacity. Photoshop likes to use the opaque values as opposed to transparent values, which really mean the same thing, but it's just approaching it from different directions. Layer masks are often called pixel masks because they use actual pixels to define that transparency. In our illustration here, we have this top layer that has no mask assigned to it. The one beneath it is a copy of the layer, but it has a mask assigned to it. You can tell by this small thumbnail that's just to the right of the layer thumbnail. This is the actual mask. And when you want to work with the mask, you need to make sure you click on the thumbnail and you get this small white outline. It's very easy to think you're working on the mask, but accidentally have the actual layer pixels selected and be working with them. And the other way around as well. Many times you'll be trying to paint or edit the layer pixels only to find that you're inadvertently editing the mask. So it's very important to pay attention to which one of these thumbnails has that white outline around it because that's the one that's currently selected or targeted is really a better term since we use selections to mean something very specific within Photoshop. The way layer masks work is that Photoshop uses the grayscale values of the mask file to determine the opacity of the corresponding pixels of that layer. For instance, you can see without the mask, we get this entire background here but this layer that does have a mask on it, we only get the facial part. So let's look at that mask file. By alt clicking on it, we actually get to view it. So the parts of the mask that are fully black mean that those corresponding pixels of the image are completely hidden. The parts of the mask that are fully white are fully opaque or completely visible. And then there's 256 different shades of gray between 100% black and 100% white. And those shades of gray determine just how much opacity those pixels have for that layer. Now that may seem an um, arbitrary distinction. The way I like to remember it is sort of like a flashlight. You shine light on the things that you want to see. So the mask is the same way. The white parts of the mask mean those are visible pixels. That's the light shining from the flashlight. Or the black parts of the mask, that's the dark areas that don't have the flashlight shining in it. So those are hidden. You can't see them. It's important to note that those pixels are still there. They are not deleted. They're simply invisible. In fact, by shift clicking on the mask thumbnail, we hide the mask or we deactivate it. You can do it by right clicking on the thumbnail as well and say disable layer mask. So you can see those pixels are still there. We enable it again and they disappear. This is a wonderful way of adjusting what's visible of your layers without having to use the eraser tool or removing any actual pixels. This idea of using a grayscale file for opacity is very similar to the way that Photoshop handles colors. Let's reveal the no mask layer, which is the original image. If we go to the channels panel, you can see that it has the composite RGB channel and each of the different colors broken down to its own channel, the red, the green and the blue. Now notice there's also the mask file down here at the bottom. That's being saved in the channels panel because it's essentially another grayscale file that's being used not necessarily as a color for this image, but it's defining the opacity. Many times this is referred to as an alpha channel. But if we click on one of the individual color channels, for instance, the red one, we can see the grayscale image that's being used to define the red properties of this image, which means it's the red pixels. So how much red content is available within these pixels is determined by this grayscale red channel. Likewise for the green and the blue. And then they all form together for the composite channel. That's the RGB channel. So once you understand that, it really makes sense that Photoshop would use a very similar mechanism to define the opacity as well. Simply because it's already got that set up within Photoshop 
to deal with color, and opacity is just being seen as almost another type of color channel. So with that in mind, think about what we can do with the different grayscale files within Photoshop. And then it makes sense as to what features we can and cannot use on a layer mask. Because it's just an assortment of black and white pixels, it makes sense that we could use things like the paintbrush or any of the other image editing tools, including the filters. For example, if we go to filter, filter gallery, and let's say we go to the torn edges filter. You can see how this filter is now adjusting the black and white elements within this mask. So we can use it to create several different types of effects by altering the mask channel directly. One of the unique things about the layer mask that the color channels don't enjoy is that there is this wonderful properties panel that attaches directly to that layer mask. And this has a couple of slider bars that directly affect the mask in what's really almost a quasi non-destructive manner and that you can easily get them back. For instance, there's this density slider where if we reduce that down, the density or the application of the mask itself gets reduced. Then there's the feather slider. So this is almost like a blurring effect on the edge of that mask. So if you increase it, we end up with a feathered mask. And of course we started with a feathered mask of a totally different sort. You should also note that each individual layer can only have one layer mask assigned to it. You cannot stack these within their own layer. And even within that mask file, there can only be the single layer within it. You cannot have multiple layers of grayscale shapes or brush strokes within a single layer mask. And that's just the basics of what layer masks can do. We've only really scratched the surface there, and we're gonna dig a lot further into the different things you can do with these later on in the course. But next up, we talk about the vector masks, and that's in lesson 2.2.